today on Ask This Old House. One of the unique features of the house, we sleep up on the second floor. The main entrance of the house is down here, two levels down. We've been looking at some security options, really high upfront costs, high monthly fees, so we've been searching for some alternatives. Installing a home security system is now a DIY friendly project. I'll walk you through the process. I'll tell you everything you need to know about Sandy. I hate sanding, so I'm going to go yeah. from 60 and then I'm going to jump right up to 220 because I'm going to save time. No, you're not going to save time. What? You just created more work for yourself. And in Akron, Ohio, I'll warm up this garage workshop with a new heater. For projects around the house, Home Advisor helps find local pros to do the work. You can check ratings, read customer reviews, and book appointments with pros online at HomeAdvisor.com. HomeAdvisor is proud to support Ask This Old House. Tommy, look at that. Wow, I never saw a crumbling on a wall like yeah. that. What's going on? It's a foundation hey there, Richard. wall, by the way. <laughs> hey, guys. How are you? Hey, Kevin. How are you? All right. Kevin. What are you looking at there? So, Kevin, we just got an email from a guy named Michael out of Springfield, Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and that's his foundation. Ew. So you see that crumbling right there on the wall? Well, that's the kind of thing that you see if someone throws salt on a concrete walk. And it shows up in the summertime because it's eating the concrete. There's a plumber in the house. It's in the basement. It doesn't look good, boys. Yeah, right. <laughs> He's that's a it. professional, right. too. I've got saying. my own project in Akron, Ohio. Catch oh, right. see you right someone want a trip to Ohio. So what are you thinking, Mark? I think I better go see it. I think that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. Let's do it. Are you Chris? I am Chris. Richard Tathui. Yes, How are you? Welcome to Akron. My pleasure. Nice to be here. Love the neighborhood, but I really love your house. It looks a little older. It's funny. It's an older look, but it's actually only about 15 years old. So we get that older look and feel and the newer accoutrements, if you will. Accoutrements. Accoutrements, yes. But you wrote to me about your garage. Yes. It's a little chilly in there. I need right. some heat. we got to take care of that. Garage. This is no garage. Look at this workshop. Fantastic. Ah, uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I love making things, building things, and yeah, cars don't come in here. This is my <laughs> workshop for sure. The issue, though, is, is weather. In the summertime, open the doors, turn on the fan, nice, cool, and comfortable. Wintertime in Akron, Ohio. Winters in Akron. Yeah. Little brisk. Yes. You know, it can get really, really freezing, and it's no fun, you know, using, using, having to wear a parka while working on a table well, saw. Or the gloves. And then the gloves. They're just <laughs> awkward. Um, now, I always knew I wanted heat out here. A few years back when we were building our brick patio, I actually had a plumber run a gas line all the way out here and up into the attic. So it, it's in the building. Good. All right. So the gas line gives you some options. You know, we could go with a conventional furnace up in that attic above us, but that's going to have duct work. It's going to pull air up inside here. Now, anytime I have a workshop, I worry about all the sawdust that can get up and can clog the filter, oh. the heat exchanger, and the blower. Oh, that'd be bad. You also could look at a thing called a unit heater, and that's uh, gas or electric, but it blows air across a heat exchanger, and that can also clog. So what if I could get you something that didn't move the air at all? That'd be great. Awesome. All right, so here's how we're going to heat your garage slash workshop. <laughs> this is a gas-fired infrared heater, a radiant heater. All right, it has a gas valve right here. You can see there's a ceramic element right here, and this will glow and get really warm. What this heater does is it's going to heat objects. Now, we've seen these before. You've seen them in commercial warehouses, in restaurants, ca outdoor cafes. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. You also know radiant heating from the sun. We stand outside on a cold day, and we might be underneath the shade of a tree. You step out, and you feel different. You feel more comfortable because those rays have come and been absorbed by you. We want to do the same thing here. So this has an aperture that's going to, anything in its path is going to absorb energy into. So that means you, the table saw, any object, okay? So we've got to think about where we place it. Now, there's a couple of considerations. One is clearance to combustible objects. You know, we want to keep it far enough away from a ceiling or a wall, and there's a bracket for that. And the other is, where do you place it in the space to get maximum output? Conventional thinking is you might put it right here. Here's your workbench, and this is where you work most often. Right. But I'd really like to put it in the corner right here Hang it from the bracket, and now that wide aperture will cover this entire space. It's going to go about 15 or 20 feet oh, that way, too. That would be All great. Right? Good. Let's get started. All right, so what I'd like you to do is to build a base 
that'll put the unit at 45 degrees from the corner. All right, here you go. Awesome. And that'll also help us with our clearance requirements. All right, are you happy? Yeah, go for it. Watch your fingers. Then we can mount the bracket and attach the heater. Okay. Yep, we're good. All right, let's pop the heater on. Awesome. Here we go. We want 14 inch clearance. Perfect. Beauty. I'm going to drill a hole up into the attic to allow the flexible gas line to be run down. All right, Chris, just feed it down, please, the flex. Thank you. With a tubing cutter, we can cut the flexible gas line to length, strip away the plastic outer coating, and make up our connection. This bracket and special fitting allows the connection between the flexible gas and our black steel pipe. When working with gas, it's important to use pipe dope for proper thread connection. On the far end of the garage, we're installing a vent. And that does a couple of things. It allows any excess moisture from the combustion process to get out of the building and allows for a little bit of combustion air to get in. All right, so we have fed a wire from the unit right to this location. Here's our thermostat right here. You can see the settings are here. They're relatively low. You can set this thing to 55 and still feel comfortable. Oh, yeah. Okay? Now, this unit has a pilot in it, and that pilot, when it's burning, will generate enough electricity to operate the thermostat, but it also means you'll have heat even when you don't have power. Really? Wow, that's okay? cool. So, feel it? There it is. Now, it's a yeah. hot summer day right here, so you're not going to appreciate that right now, but you will in Akron winter. You bet I will. Thank have you so much. Have a warm winter. All right, my friend. Tommy, when it comes to sanding, we know you are meticulous, you are fastidious, but the odd thing is, you actually like it. I do like it. Think about it, sanding can make or break a project. That's you can point. do a really good project, and it'd be really sweet, but if you did a lousy job on the finish, yeah. what's the first thing people are gonna see? Lousy finish. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about a lousy finish and some of the problems we see with sanding. Here's all one right. of them. So here's a lousy job right here. You see all the little marks that they are do. done right there? Mm -hmm. um, and that's just somebody that was being lazy. They probably skipped grades. That's a, that's a coarse sandpaper right there, and they tried to finish it up. And, and the lines are coming from the grit, and there are a lot of different grits that you can get out there. There sure are. Oh, here's some blocks that you get at the home center. This is 36, mm -hmm. this is 120, and this is 220. Lower the number, the grittier it is. That's right. The more material this one will remove, but this will give me a better finish. Right. Here, for example, here's, a, here's some in a row. I'm going to flip these over just to remind me of the order. So here we've got 60, 80, 120, 180, 220, 320. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty typical progression. That's pretty typical. Could we go could go way down to 24. Right. Or we can go all the way up to four or 5,000. Right. So the low, again, is gritty um, and higher. So what do you think about this? I, I know what you think about this, but I hate sanding. So I'm going to go yeah. from 60, and then I'm going to jump right up to 220 because I'm going to save time. No, you're not going to save time. What? You just created more work for yourself. A hard concept for people to understand. Explain that. Well, let's think of this coarse grit is going to remove a lot of material fast. Mm -hmm. This finer grit is not going to remove the material fast enough for you to get down to the grit lines that this one left. So faster to go through the increments. It actually c takes you less time right. when you graduate up. Okay. I know you also really care about cleanliness, about picking up the dust, and not just because we don't want to breathe it in, and we don't, but yeah. you don't like any of that being left behind between grits. Between grits. So I love a sander with a vacuum system, right. okay? Or a little bag. Or a battery with a vacuum. This is a battery operated one. Cool. But the, most sanders have the little bag attachments, and you yeah. should have them connected. I've seen painters have them with the blowing the dust in the air. Why do you care about the grit left behind? Because I don't want this grit from the course left behind when I'm doing something fine because the fine will make 
that mm. mark. So that, a piece of 60 left behind, if you've got 120 on the paper, it's really just pushing that little That's piece right, of 60 good around. because it's stuck on that 60 paper. That's All a right. good tip. Let's talk about the different kinds of sanders out there. Belt uh, sanders. Belt san aggressive. A very aggressive. Hard to use. Too, I don't use much uh, belt sander much anymore, but you know, when you want to remove a lot, you go diagonal with that. But then you got to go straight mm. like this to remo remove those marks. And again, you got to start with a, a coarser paper and work your way up. Easy to leave marks. And right, you got to be careful that, that you don't tilt it because right. it will actually put a gouge in there. So these are both palm sanders, even though I call this palm and random orbit. But this is this is technically a finish sander, right? In finishing the palm. sander. Yeah. I see painters use that a lot. Painters use them a lot for you know because they're working around trim and all that. Right. And they're trying to finish sand something. But I, it kills me when I see these guys take these sanders and now they're going to try to sand something. They're going like this, you know, they're thinking they're speeding it all up, and they're really not doing anything except causing them thander to create marks. So moving it around, let the machine let do the, the work. Let the machine do the work. Turn it on and slowly move it back right, and forth. Right, there's enough vibration coming out of the pad. Uh, in terms of doing the work, this one does the work in a random orbit pattern. And I right. think this is probably the most forgiving, at least the one that most people reach for. Well, I think this is one. You can go across the grain and you can go with the grain and diagonal. Again, you want to move it slowly and you don't want to push down too hard. Right. Big uh, mistake that people make. So random orbit, that's what this guy is. It happens to be attached to a vac and it's more aggressive because it's got a couple settings. Well, this has a setting that I can be random orbit, but it also has a setting where it's really strong and it will almost grind, right? but it will also polish. And, and also, I mean, while this isn't random orbit, um, this is the age of the battery, where the battery is powerful enough to get it into a standard. Battery, and I can hook this up to the vacuum if I want to, and I can also plug that model in. All right. Well, I appreciate the information. I still don't understand why you like it, but I'm glad you do. <laughs>be high upfront fee, like you said, and high monthly fee. Yeah. But things have changed. The Internet of Things and the smartphone have allowed companies to come up with DIY-friendly smart home solutions. What's great about that is that there's little to no monthly fee. So great. I've got a bunch in the truck, but before I install anything, I want to take a look at what you got inside. Okay, excellent. Let's take a look. Thanks. All right, Mike, we've taken a look through the house, and we're going to install some door sensors, some motion sensors, and some cameras in strategic locations. Great. All right. And they're going to all wirelessly talk to the brain of the system. All right? Okay. So this is the hub. Okay. So this hub is connected to the internet um, and connects all the devices in the house down to this one station. Okay. All right? We typically would locate this near the door that you're going to be coming and going from, so I assume this would be it this right here. This is it, yeah. Okay, great. Um, it has a couple features with it. So first is a keypad on top. So you can arm and disarm the system by pressing the right code, and you can have different codes for different people. All right? They also offer a key fob, so you can actually wave that over the top of it to arm or disarm the system. Okay. But for you and your fiance, I think most of the time, you're going to be using your smartphone. That's right. All right. So it connects through the internet to your smartphone, and it has GPS connectivity, so it knows exactly where you are in relation to your house. That's great. All right. So first starts uh, with the QR code scan. Okay. All right. So I noticed that you guys have uh, smart thermostats that are compatible you with do. the system. So let's start with the scan. All right, great. And then hit OK and OK, all right. And now we can get this plugged in. OK, great. So the first thing we're going to do is plug in the micro USB to the back of the device. Once the micro USB is plugged into the device, we can fish the wire down and plug it in to their plug. And now this could just be plugged into a regular receptacle. OK. In this case, we're going to install this, which prevents an accidental unplugging, and that screw hole matches up with the cover plate screw hole. Great. The system has one type of sensor, and this has multiple functions, okay? It gives you a motion sensor here that's going to alert you for high traffic areas if you have any motion. But you can also add this contact sensor, and by doing that, you can put it on doors and windows, so it will let you know if the, if the door window is open. Okay. Okay, so the process steps by a QR code scan, All right, now use the double-sided tape. 
All right, great. We're going to do that at every entry door. Okay. All right, Mike, we are going to replace your hardwired doorbell switch okay. with a combination doorbell camera. And the camera connects to your phone. So you can see what's going on in your driveway at any time. Very nice. Okay, so I've checked the transformer voltage. You're good for this system. And I've already wired it to the chime. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to pull the cover plate off and then wire it up. Great. Okay, now we can put the doorbell plate back on. And if you want to pass me one of those screws, okay. we can start with using the existing screw holes. Okay, Phillips. Now we can add the sensor. Okay, so now we can feed the wire in, top first, lock down. All right, now I got one more thing to show you inside. All right, so on the first floor, we got really good coverage with the front door sensor and the rear door sensor. Yeah. But here in the living room, we got a little bit of a dead spot, especially with the liability of this large window. So one option is we could put a motion sensor to, to cover this room, but okay. I, like, I like to throw this into the mix, an indoor camera, okay? It also has motion sensing, okay? So we can mount it here, and it has facial recognition software. Wow. So it's gonna recognize your face and your fiance's face, and it's gonna learn the system over time. So it's only gonna detect you when it sees motion from someone it doesn't recognize. Pretty smart. All right? And then you can get that alert in your phone, you can call the police, you can talk to them and really freak them out. <laughs> That'd be an interesting way to do it. <laughs> so here we go, we're gonna scan the QR code with the app, okay. and then we're gonna power it up. All right, great. Plug it in, and we're good. All right, Mike, with your system installed, your house is not only safer, but smarter. And whether you're upstairs or whether you're a thousand miles away, always be able to keep an eye on your house. Thanks, Ross, appreciate it. Take care. Take care. That's pretty cool. I have to say, I love the idea that we now have these DIY systems, right? We don't have to always rely on sort of the central station, the professionally installed system. That's sure. nice. Although I am wondering now about cost, because I've got to buy all those components. Right. So a base package, about 400 to $500. But with all the add-on uh, devices here, it was $1,000. And you could keep going from there, right? Because you just added a couple of sensors and a camera, more yeah. cameras, more sensors, more cost. You can have as many devices as you want. All right. Uh, whenever I hear something works off a of Wi-Fi, I've now learned that when the power goes out, the Wi-Fi goes yeah. out. Yeah. What happens in that situation? What's great about this system is Wi-Fi goes down or the power goes out, either one, you're still got a protected home. The security system's still active. There's batteries in all the devices, so everything's still active. You're just not going to get an alert to your phone. Right, because right. with Wi-Fi, the hub's now disconnected. So I'm secure, but I don't know they're breaking in. I mean, right. how do I get around that? So there is a monthly service fee for cellular, right? So that works regardless of Wi-Fi or power, right, yeah. to the house. And so that will give you an alert no matter what. That's an added monthly fee. There's also central station monitoring for another fee. So you can add that to this system? That's right. Oh, yeah, cool. so it's got automatic. Someone's always watching your house. All right. And then the final question is, with all these systems, everyone's concerned about hacking. Right. Right, so now someone can maybe hack into the system and shut it down. You're not protected. Right or even worse, turn the cameras around and start watching you. Right. I mean, with any electronic device that's connected to Wi-Fi, there's always a risk for hacking. Uh, manufacturers like this use the latest encryption software, so the risk is very low, but it's still a possibility. And so you really have to weigh, and it's a trade-off between privacy and convenience. Right. All right. Well, good information as always. Thank you. Thanks. Mark, you're back from your trip to Western Mass and your investigation into, uh, it was Michael's foundation? Uh, Michael out of Springfield, right. What did you figure out? Well, what we found was stuff that's not so good. Mm. Um, you remember what concrete's made out of. Uh oh, test, right? So we got Portland cement, yep. sand, aggregate. And aggregate. So in the aggregate in this particular concrete, uh, we found a uh, mineral called pyrotite. And in that pyrotite is another mineral called iron sulfide. Okay. Yeah, so once that stuff gets hit by water or moisture interacts with it, kind of puffs up, swells a bit, and also rusts. 
So they got a bad mix? They got a bad mix, but that bad mix seemed to have uh, continued for quite a while. Wait, wait, wait. So this is not just a problem with Michael's house? This is a bad mix coming from where? We've actually found this problem in northern Connecticut, western Massachusetts. A this lot of houses. Like how many? We're talking hundreds or thousands? Uh, right now we're talking about 36,000 houses, but that list could be endless. What? They've How does been, that happen? Well, they've been milling this quarry since, like I said, the early 80s, yeah. all the way up until last year. So and they don't f have this problem 20 years ago? Well, that's it. 20 years is the number. It usually takes about 20 years for this problem to surface. Oh, my goodness. Tom, are you hearing this? <laughs> I've been listening. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. So we've got tens of thousands of homes, something I didn't even know was in the concrete, and, I mean, the foundation crumbling. I think foundation. I mean, the foundation that's is the house. key to the house. Yeah. That's holding it all up. I mean, you've got your concrete footing, you've got your walls, you've got your floor. And if that's all bad, you've got to take that out. How are you going to do it? Well, you're going to remove the house off of the foundation. You've got to support it, slide it out of the way, oh. blast out all of that foundation with jackhammers, take it all out, and pour a whole new base, whole new walls, and floors. Financially devastating oh. to Michael to have to go through that. So, but now, I mean, if you think about it, it's financially devastating to the point where we don't know if these guys can go to a home, I mean a bank and get a loan. Right. Um, oh, yeah, the value of your house is true. That's but, right. But at 36,000 homes, I mean, it's not just Michael's house. It could be an right. entire street or an entire neighborhood with a holy mackerel. That is definitely. You, have you heard I've this? been listening. Yikes. This is, I mean, tens of thousands of houses. I mean, it really just sounds like it's another in a long list of the sort of the nightmares we've heard oh, about in the building yeah, industry. Yeah. You know, urea formaldehyde was once this insulation with all this promise it outgassed. You know, lead paint was no, who knew lead that? Lead paint. They thought that was great. That's right, yeah. right. And then even lead to a water main. So this is awful. So is there any recourse for Michael and the, and the tens of thousands of others? Uh, a little bit right now. State of Connecticut has got a fund that already has $100 million in it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how much that'll, that'll help. Again, you're talking about a big, big problem. Yeah, and he's not in Connecticut. He's not in Connecticut. State of Massachusetts has done nothing as of yet, and we're even, not us, but people are even petitioning FEMA for some relief. Right. So we don't know how far that'll go. Right. So unfortunately at this stage, the only news for Michael is bad news, is that there's nothing out there to help him through this. Unfortunately, design. yeah, I think he's up a creek without a paddle, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is uh, difficult news, Michael, and to the other tens of thousands yeah, who are in right. the same situation. So we are sorry to deliver that information. Um, we do want your questions to keep coming, though, and we'll continue right. to get you answers, I guess, regardless of where those answers lead us. Right. Yeah. So until next time, I'm Kevin O'Connor. I'm Richard Thewey. I'm Mark McCullough. And I'm Tom Silva. For Ask This Old House. Thanks for watching. This Old House has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.